Year of the Nurse, Real Nurses, Real Stories. My name is Carolyn Van Oosten. I'm the Senior Vice President of Strategic Partnerships and Workforce Development at Herzing University. I'm privileged to moderate a relevant and timely discussion presented by Herzing and a dynamic group of thought leaders in healthcare industry. As an accredited nonprofit university with over 70% of our current students preparing to become nurse and healthcare leaders, and over 12,000 and counting alumni serving throughout our country during this challenging pandemic, this topic is near and dear to our hearts. Before we jump in, I'd like to express a special thanks to all the nurses keeping us safe during COVID-19. We appreciate your bravery, dedication, and sacrifice. Now, let me share what we will cover today. I'll introduce our presenters. We'll hear from industry leaders and their take on the future of nursing. We will hear from real nurses as they share their stories and insights from their career, as well as understand what led them into practice. We will also gain an understanding of the different educational pathways in nursing. Please submit any questions via the chat box and we'll direct those to our presenters at the end of their session. Also, if you have any technical difficulties, send a message and someone will attempt to assist. Introduce today's talented presenters, Dr. Fran Roberts. Dr. Roberts grew from clinical practice and leadership in Arizona to serve as a leader in the state as the executive director for the Arizona Board of Nursing and vice president of professional services for the Arizona Hospital and Health Care Association. She has served in many leadership roles at numerous education institutions. Her experience has been key in building and developing collaborative relationships, driving the development of alliances and healthcare systems to deliver outstanding educational programming, secure clinical rotations, and enhance employment opportunities for graduates at all the institutions she served. In 2012, she created the Fran Roberts Group, putting 30 years of experience to practice. We will also hear from Dr. Patricia Wagner. Dr. Wagner has been a nurse since 1997. When Dr. Wagner first became a nurse, she practiced as an emergency room nurse for the first five years of her career. During this time, she returned to school to complete her Bachelor's of Science in Nursing. Through 2007 to 2010, Dr. Wagner received both her Master's of Science in Nursing as well as her Doctorate in Nursing. Throughout the years, she has gained experience not only in the ER, but also in obstetrics, home health, and hospice, which led her to academia and leadership. She has served in several leadership positions, including professor, educational director, dean of nursing, and administrative director of a 600-bed hospital. She has successfully implemented residency programs in two hospitals and dedicated education units across the country. Today, she currently serves as a department chair of online nursing at Herzing University. We will also hear from Kyle Ebert. Kyle made his career change later in life and earned his BSN degree in 2018. Today, Kyle works as a registered nurse in the intensive care unit at SSM Health St. Joseph's Hospital in St. Charles, Missouri. In that role, he works with a variety of critical ill patients. His care helps patients recovering from coronary artery bypass, stroke, head trauma, pulmonary disease, such as those who have COVID-19. So let's go ahead and get started. Dr. Roberts, let's begin with you. Can you share some facts on nursing? Thank you very much, Carolyn. And, and first of all, thanks to Herzing University for uh, inviting me to share in this uh, webinar and also to my co-presenters and to all of our attendees. I'm uh, very excited about taking a brief moment to chat with you about my beloved profession, nursing. And first we'll talk about uh, quick facts about nursing. And um, probably even prior to this slide, I'd like to say, well, what's the best fact about nursing and that's 
Year after year, we are the most trusted profession in the United States, according to Gallup poll after Gallup poll. And I don't need to tell any of you that if you watch the news morning, noon, or night, um, we're now the, the newest heroes on the landscape. So that's probably the best fact about nursing that I can share with you. But on to data. The 2019 median pay, and this is based on uh, BLM statistics uh, for baccalaureate prepared nurses, is $73,000 per year or approximately $35,000 per hour. So this means, of course, not your new grad, and not your advanced practice nurse, but generally the, um, the median of all nurses who are practicing. So those of you who are already into um, advanced practice or whatever, probably make more. Those of you aspiring to become a new nurse might enter at a lower level, but not much lower. The job outlook, and let me tell you, these um, stats were pulled together prior to COVID-19. Um, and as much as a tragedy as this is to all of us, to specific to nursing in these stats, um, it's just unbelievable. The job outlook now, which was projected 2018 to 2028, um, is going to be growing even faster, I would estimate, than the 12% than the, um, that we have on here. Also, issues um, to avoiding the nursing shortage. Those of you who've tracked nursing via friends or family members know that we go back and forth with shortages, once in a while, a surplus, you'll see nurses being laid off. Um, not anymore. We're uh, really looking at currently about 3.8 million nurses employed in the United States and uh, estimating that we're going to increase to about 11 million registered nurses and other healthcare workers by 2028. Excuse me, 2028. And again, that's pre COVID. Um, retiring nurses. More than 500,000 seasoned RNs are anticipated to retire by 2022. Um, we're probably going to, have a lot, going to have a lot of very exhausted nurses out there um, taking care of our COVID and other patients right now who might even um, look at increasing uh, the time to retirement. So as you can imagine, all of these things play into each other to paint a very uh, strong picture for nursing demand in terms of everything from demand in nursing, rising salaries, increased job security, increased job status, and what, what have you. Um, next slide, Carolyn, if you will. So my take on nursing. So some of you know the song, and if I could have audio, if I could have plugged this into here, I would have, the future's so bright, you gotta wear shades. Um, it's just unbelievable the promise that holds for nursing um, as of two months ago and as, as of now. I would venture to uh, project that some of you watching this uh, webinar today might not have even thought about nursing six months ago, but what you're seeing in terms of the passion, uh, the job security, the commitment, the income um, has all changed. So the future's so bright, you've got to wear shades, increased demand at all levels. And you'll hear a little bit more about this, probably a little bit more on in the um, presentation. First of all, we always think of bedside nursing as the, the center of what we're all about. Acute care hospital nursing, we will see that increasing. There's no way that the demand for hospital nursing will not increase at the baccalaureate and higher level. Community-based nursing care, that's hospice, home care, clinics, all that you see going on now. Um, school nursing, all of those things will increase from the baccalaureate um, level of education up. Educators, how are we going to be able to increase enrollment in schools such as Herzing without nursing faculty? Right now, there's an incredible shortage of nursing faculty. Again, I'm sure one of our speakers will address this, and that's generally at the master's and doctoral level. So we really need for people to be thinking about becoming nurse educators. Advanced practice nurses, and that's what we call our nurse practitioners. I happen to be one, I'm a psychiatric nurse practitioner. The demand for psych nurse practitioners and community mental health is incredible. Um, family nurse practitioners, there's a whole range of specializations. CRNAs, certified registered nurse anesthetists, demand is incredible. Midwives, in some states, Midwives develop, develop, excuse me, um, deliver more babies than obstetricians. Believe that or not, it is true. 
um, clinical nurse specialists, specialists are um, specialized nurses practicing within hospital and acute care settings. And again, masters prepared or above. So all of those levels will be growing. And educators um, uh, also can require either a master's or a doctorate or a PhD in nursing. So what does a family nurse practitioner do? Well, think about going to your own practitioner. Think about how many of you in the past went to your physician, DO or an MD. How many of you now are going to see a nurse practitioner? Primary care, um, whether it's taking your kids for an ear infection, going yourself for uh, a checkup, basically everything that doesn't necessarily involve hospital-based care, i.e. in the hospital, uh, family nurse practitioners do. And that's across the entire age span. So more can come on that. Why should you consider getting into the nursing field? Well, I actually think that this question should be reframed. Why not? Why would you not want to enter nursing at this point in time? It is both a calling, it involves your heart, your head, and your hands. So everything about you as a human being is called to the table to be a registered nurse. Um, why not? Um, we are open to minorities, we are open to gender, we are open to part-time, we are open to full-time, re-careers. Many, many people go into nursing who were first engineers or school teachers. I've, I've known a physical therapist who's gone into nursing to be able to treat the person holistically. You can go into nursing because it's a profession. It is a highly thought of profession. It's no longer just thought of as an occupation or a vocation. It's a very um, re reputable and respected profession, as I've said before. As an economic career, where else can you plot your entire career across your lifespan in a variety of nursing fields and a variety of income levels? Um, years ago, nurses were thought of as not being well paid, unfortunately similar to teachers nowadays. That is no longer the case as you saw some, um, in some prior statistics. So one last thing of why you should consider becoming a nursing, going into the nursing field, it gives you an opportunity to be a hero. Carolyn, back to you. Thank you so much, Fran, for your insights. That was great. Next up, we'll turn it over to Dr. Patricia Wagner. Dr. Wagner will share her nursing journey, journey, touch on how you can get into the field of nursing. Thank you, Carolyn. I'm excited to share my story with all of you today. We've all seen the preschoolers and kindergartens that hold up the sign that says, I want to be a police officer. Or I want to be a teacher. Mine was always, I want to be a nurse. My mom was the person who made sure that I had all the opportunities that I needed to be a nurse. She helped me through exploring the role as a candy striper. This was a volunteer position, so I wasn't really sure about that. Uh, but it actually gave me the opportunity to get in the hospital and start learning what the insides of a hospital look like, what was there, and it also gave me the opportunity to interact with patients. I got to deliver flowers to patients, give directions to visitors, and even read to patients with, uh, with no visitors. I worked there for three years in that role until I was able to transition to a weekend job in the ER at the age of 16. I worked the night shift as a receptionist. There were no triage nurses back then, so it was just me and a security guard. One night I had a husband come in and requesting a wheelchair. So I got the wheelchair, just a note. He didn't tell me why he needed it. So I went outside to help him and found his wife in the back seat of their car delivering a baby. I was able to assist and caught their baby. It was my very first catch, but not my last. This solidified my dream even more into becoming a nurse. I filled out all the applications to nursing school. I was accepted and even had a full ride scholarship. However, as many of you know, life happens. And I found out at the age of 17, I was pregnant. All of my dreams were gonna be placed on hold so that I could start my life as a wife and a mom. Even after all the joys that come with being a wife and a mom, which of course everyone knows there are many, I still had a dream and that was to be a nurse. The journey was not always easy. 
it was important to, for me to be successful, not just for myself, but also for my family, as they're the ones that helped me to get where I, where I was able to return to school. I had to get all my ducks in a row, and prior to that start date of nursing school, there was a lot of work involved, a lot of school, study, time for my husband, time for my kids, and all of them needed to have a portion of my day. This was 24-7. It included early mornings, long days, weekends. I didn't even know what a weekend was at that time. There were many more events that impacted my decision. One event stands out clearly as I was in nursing school. It was very normal for me and my family to walk of an evening after, after dinner. We'd walk to the local convenience store. Uh, it was a gas station just around the corner from our house. One night we just got into the store and the kids were choosing their little penny candy for their treats. When outside, there was a young child that was hit by a truck in the parking lot. One of the ways you know you're created to be a nurse is when you run to and not run away. I was the first person on the scene. I had to start CPR. This young child didn't survive. However, the impact that the situation had on my life remains, and it's something I will never forget. There were many successes along the way, from getting an A on my first pharmacology test, to barely passing my midterm and mid surge, to being a student of the month. But most importantly, passing my nursing license exam on the first time so that I could start my dream job, which was that emergency and trauma room nurse. I was able to start in the ER and work here for the first five years of my nursing career. During that time, there was a night uh, that it was my very first night as the charge nurse and um, we had a tornado that hit our home and it was our it was a small portion of the town but there were several people that were injured we had about 50 patients that entered our er most of them had minor injuries broken bones cuts um, but some of them had a few more serious problems but i can remember that i was so engaged as a nurse and knowing that I made a difference for others in their time of need was something I will never forget. With nursing, you have the benefit of being able to work many different places, as you can tell, you know, from a, from a emergency and trauma room nurse, I went to being a labor and delivery nurse. Um, I was an elementary school nurse for a short time. I worked in home health and hospice. With all those places I worked, I knew that it was important for me to stay at bedside caring for patients. So I kept thinking, how could I continue to advance my career? With that in mind, I entered a nurse practitioner program and had my eyes on owning my own clinic. So back to school I went, hard work, time, perseverance, and just pure grit. My dreams, they did come true. I became a nurse practitioner and collaborated with a high school friend of my husband's in an acute care clinic, where I still get to work today on an as needed basis. We meet the needs of those that are uninsured or underinsured with a cash pay clinic. We also offer our services to the local shelter free of charge, providing screenings and clinics at least once a month. Along the way, I learned a couple of things. First, that I love to educate others and help them reach their goals. That's when I decided to enter academia nursing and become a nurse educator. This allowed me a lot of growth as an individual as well as a nurse. As Fran previously mentioned, there is a huge shortage of nurse educators. The role of a nurse educator allows you to spend time with your family on weekends and holidays. And sometimes, depending upon where you work, you may even have a nine-month schedule so you get to have summers off with your kids. With my desire for education and becoming an entrepreneur, a doctor of nursing practice was in my view ahead. I was able to go back to school again and complete this degree in two years to keep me on a, journey, a strong trajectory for nursing leadership in academia or a practice setting. The journey has recently led me to Herzing University, working with some an amazing nurse educators that are engaged practitioners that desire to educate the next generation of nursing leaders, nursing educators, and nursing practitioners. As you, see the, as you can see, the path may not be short, and there may be starts and stops along the way, but with a passion for helping and serving others, you get to create a life that you've always wanted for yourself, and as an individual, not only just for you, but for your family. 
There are many steps along the way that allow you to reach your goals. You just have to take them one step at a time. So how can I help you make your dreams come true? At Herzine, there are many entry points into the nursing profession. You can start by earning your diploma in practical nursing and become an LPN, or you could start by earning your associate's or bachelor's degree and become an RN. For those who hold a bachelor's degree in another field, such as liberal arts degree, you might be interested in our accelerated BSN, which may allow you to transfer in credits from any previous degree that you have. This helps create a faster pathway for you to get your, get your career as a registered nurse. And of course, Herzing also offers our master's programs in nursing, such as the family nurse practitioner, nurse educator, and nurse leadership and administration programs. At Herzing, we have many pathways for you to move forward in your nursing career. There are so many options available to you and I encourage you to make every experience count in your life. In my opinion, you will never regret choosing to become a nurse and making your dreams come true. Thank you so much, Trisha, for sharing your story. That was very inspiring. Next, we'll hear from Kyle as he walks us through the ins and outs of being an intensive care unit nurse. Uh, thank you for having me here today. Uh, hello, again, my name is Kyle Ebert. Uh, I'm an ICU nurse at SSM Health St. Joseph Hospital in St. Charles, Missouri. Uh, nursing is my second career. As I mentioned before, I have a business management degree. I spent several years doing a few different jobs that really left me unhappy. Uh, kind of figured out I needed to make some changes in my life, and I remembered that in high school, one of my favorite teachers used to always tell me, Kyle, you like to help people. You should do something where you help people. So that led me to, to nursing school. And then I get to school, I start taking these science class prereqs and I remember, oh yeah, I liked all this stuff. <laughs> I can't believe I never thought of this before. Uh, and since getting into that, it's been so, my life has been so much more fulfilling. Things have been a lot better. It's just so different from a, a regular, office kind of job uh, and for me at least it's it's a lot better. I remember when I got out of nursing school it's really important that you figure out what specialty area do you want to get into. I knew that I wanted to either be working in pediatric uh, environments or in an adult ICU in critical care so I ended up getting the interview where I'm at now and the team there was great the program they had for new graduate nurses coming out to get them up to speed in, in an ICU environment was really well done. And they asked me to join the team and I was very excited, joined, I've been really happy ever since. Just so you have an idea of what exactly an ICU nurse is, we deal with the sickest patients in the hospital. The most critically ill patients end up in the ICU, there's no step above that really as far as level of care. So some hospitals, some of the bigger hospitals have different ICUs for different specialty areas, neuro, cardiac. Our hospital is a little smaller than that. So we actually get a good mix of a bunch of different kinds of patients. So I'll take care of stroke patients, patients who have had open heart surgery that are recovering, uh, patients that have organ failure from all sorts of various different reasons. So it's a really interesting change of pace depending on who you have for the night. A big thing you have to do as an ICU nurse when you're taking care of these patients because they're so ill is it's a lot of critical thinking, a lot of connecting the dots, uh, being able to quickly respond to changes in patients so that they don't deteriorate quickly. So you're working very closely with your intensivist, that's, that's the doctor, the critical care doctor that is always there to, to help manage these patients. They are there 24 seven, uh, just like the nurses are. We don't ever have a situation where there's not a critical care doctor. Then we also work with the different therapists. Respiratory therapy is a big one. So many of our patients are on ventilators, they can't breathe on their own. Those respiratory therapists help manage those ventilators with us. They deal a lot with different oxygen needs. What, you know, even if they're not on a ventilator, maybe the patient requires some oxygen uh, for other reasons or uh, has to be on a 
different machine at night just to help them breathe, things like that. So if you're interested in potentially considering getting into the ICU, I can tell you a little bit about a typical day for an ICU nurse. Before all this COVID-19 stuff started happening, a typical day would be you go to your, your shift, seven, well, depending, I work night shift, so 7 p.m. to 7.30 a.m. for me, uh, but you'd get there, you'd get report from the nurse that is leaving, find out about your patients, because our patients are so critically ill, we only ever take up to two patients at a time. Depending on the situation, you may only have one patient, and that patient is the only one you're caring for because they require so much attention. After you get report, you kind of lay eyes on your patients, make sure that they're doing okay. We do full head to toe assessments every four hours on these patients to make sure nothing's changing. That's looking at everything from, you know, their pupils, their, their eyes, all the way down to their pedal pulses, their pulses in their feet, uh, you know, listening to heart sounds, lung sounds, making sure they don't have any sores that are developing. Uh, and we got to monitor those changes frequently. Another thing we do, we have to take vitals like blood pressure, temperature, neuro changes, things like are they, are they responding to commands, things like that. We do that stuff hourly at least. Blood pressure is a big one. Sometimes we have to check that every 15 minutes or even, every, even more often than that, depending on their condition. We also have to pass medications or based on the condition of the patient, we, we may have to hold medications. We may have to look at things and say, wait a minute, we can't give this medication right now because the patient is in this condition and we have to make those decisions for them to make sure that they're safe. We also are responsible for turning our patients every two hours, make sure they don't get bed sores because so many of these patients are not able to do any of that themselves. And then we give baths every day. All of our patients get baths to prevent infections because they have all of these lines and things going in them. We don't want that, them to get infected. And that requires a lot of teamwork because some of our patients are gonna be you know, extremely big and require maybe four people to turn them just so we can take a look at their back. And you get to know your teammates very well and it really requires a team-oriented mindset to help because a lot of times you've got stuff you need to do, but somebody else needs help and you need to be able to set that stuff aside and pick it back up. Uh, but a good team is very important in the ICU. Uh, now, ever, uh, ever since COVID-19, most of that is all the same. We're still doing all of those things, but now when I go into work, I'm wearing a mask. We wear cloth masks in and out of the hospital. Uh, we wear street clothes instead of our, our scrubs into the hospital and actually change there because you don't want to bring that gunk home. The hospital does supply scrubs for us if we want. I still use my own because they, they just fit more comfortably. Uh, but I take those off. Those go straight in the washing machine as soon as I get home. While you're actually on the ICU, you're wearing a surgical mask the entire time because these are very sick patients. And if you get one of them sick with COVID-19, it could be very disastrous. So we have to take those precautions to make sure we're not spreading this to, to people that are already in a compromised position. We also opened up a separate ICU for COVID positive patients. So they're mostly ventilated patients uh, that, that have the machine breathing for them. So these critically ill patients are all off on their own to prevent it from being spread around. On that unit, we have to do what is called airborne precautions. And if you see the picture there on the right is actually uh, me and a couple of my friends at work in our airborne precautions getup. So we have to wear either an N95 mask, which is the white mask my friend Holly is wearing in there, uh, or a half mask, which is what my friend Emily and I are both wearing in this picture. Uh, that can be very heavy. After 12 hours of wearing one of those, you definitely have marks and lines and stuff. We've all tried a bunch of different ways of making that feel a little more comfortable. None of them work, but we try. Uh, you also have to wear yellow gowns, like what we're wearing in there. They're paper gowns. They'll, they rip off. They're disposable. We take those off when we leave the unit. It's to prevent us from spreading droplets of this stuff all over the hospital. You also have to wear eye protection, either a face shield or eye mask. Uh, eye protection like what the, the 
girls are wearing in this picture here uh, to prevent those droplets from getting in your eyes. Another big change in the hospital is we haven't been allowing patient family members to come into the hospital at all, especially in the COVID unit. Even if a patient is dying in the COVID unit, family members can't come in. Um, and it's very difficult. It's a hard thing for them. Uh, it's a hard thing for us too, honestly. It, sometimes having family there makes our lives a little bit easier in some ways, but right now we're the only connection these family members have with their loved one. So we have to be conscious of updating them, talking to them about what's happening. If we have the time and the resources, we'll set up a Zoom meeting or a FaceTime call, something like that, so they can actually put eyes on their loved one. Uh, but that you know requires us to actually have the time to do those things. It can be a little difficult. Another big change is these emergent procedures that we would do, things like CPR, or uh, it's called intubation when we put the, the tube down into somebody to, to hook up the ventilator so it can breathe for them. Well, these things spray the virus everywhere. So we actually, a procedure that we used to just go do and would take a, you know, a couple minutes to intubate someone, the doctor comes in, does it. Now we have to move the patient into their own, a, a separate room spe specifically for this procedure. We have to get all dressed up in the special suit called a PAPR to protect us. The doctor has to get dressed up. The respiratory therapist has to get dressed up. It can take about 30 minutes for us all to get ready to go intubate this patient. Meanwhile, your patient is struggling to breathe. So it's, it's difficult to do these things, but it's very important. We actually have uh, a nurse recently who, on our other COVID unit, our, our non-critical care unit, rushed in to save a patient from falling because they were getting up on their own and they weren't supposed to be. She didn't take the time to put on her, her equipment and she ended up getting sick with COVID-19, was in the hospital. She was very close to being on a ventilator. Luckily, she got to go home, everything worked out, but it's something we have to be conscious of all the time. Uh, and that <laughs> brings me to going home now after you, you get off your shift. My clothes, I, my shoes don't leave my car. I take them off as soon as I get to the parking garage, I switch shoes. I shower immediately when I get home after throwing all my clothes into the washing machine, try to avoid touching things. And then you have to really consider now even with things opening back up, how safe is it for you to go even socially distance and spend time with family members? What's the risk after working directly with these kind of patients of accidentally exposing, you know, grandma or grandpa or, or mom or mom and dad to, to these issues? Um, and you, you just really have to think about all of those things. Uh, all that being said, I'm extremely grateful to be a nurse now. I, I think this this role is really meant for people who feel like they want to help and make a difference for other people's lives. You can see that and it's not always a happy ending for people, but there's so many times, I have so many stories of times where I've been able to help people and gotten thank yous, even from family members who have lost their loved one um, that make you realize that it makes a difference just being a good nurse for them, even if it doesn't work out right. Uh, it's, it's just a very rewarding experience. Uh, I wish some of the advice I could have gotten before I started this whole thing was actually working with those family members, having those hard conversations with family members that have to deal with patients that, that can't speak. So, you know, your husband is on a ventilator and sedated and you can't control any of that. Every time I go to do something, I might have a checklist a mile long of things I need to do for this person. But this, this woman, need, she's worried, she has no control. She wants to know, why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? What is happening? And it's easy to get annoyed by all those questions. It's really important to remember they're doing this because they care. And it's really good that this person has a family member that cares because not everybody does. And they're going through one of the most difficult times of their life. So being able to stop and explain those things and see the understanding as they learn to trust you and what you're doing, it, it really makes a difference. And it's a special kind of feeling knowing that you've made things easier 
for them in this difficult time. And then an, another big piece of advice I would give to new nurses coming on, one of the things you're gonna have to do is pick that specialty field. Uh, for me, I love the ICU. I love dealing with my extremely sick two patients that have a bunch of different IV drips going, and, uh, but I control everything that's going on. Other people might really enjoy having six patients that can all breathe on their own and tell you when something's wrong and actually do stuff themselves. Uh, other people really enjoy the, the psych aspect where the illness isn't super obvious that you actually have to think and analyze what is happening and uh, go through all of that. And then there's labor and delivery where people really enjoy working with those newborn babies and, and new mothers and fathers and getting all that figured out. Uh, my biggest advice would be figure out what fits you when you're in nursing school. You get all these opportunities. You go to these different specialty areas. Don't just do the minimum work while you're there. Actually stop and ask questions. Observe what's going on. Ask the nurses, what's, what's it like here? What's, what are the challenges that you run into? What are the things that are rewarding about this job? Uh, it really gives you an opportunity to find that fit for yourself because I can tell you there are so many different areas to go into in nursing. If you're meant to be a nurse, if this is what's for you, I promise you can find a good fit for you. It's out there. So uh, you just gotta take the time to look and, and pay attention. All right, I really appreciate the time. Thank you very much. I want to thank all of our presenters, first and foremost, for their commitment to making a difference, and of course, the time they took to prepare and present the information that was shared today. We encourage you to visit herzing.edu to learn more and engage with us in social media. You'll see our students, their stories, and the difference they're making in their communities. With extensive experience in online learning and a long history of preparing nurses and healthcare leaders, Herzing is well positioned to forge ahead and meet students' needs. And we are excited to welcome a new group of students on September 8th. We are enrolling for the fall semester and hope you reach out to learn more and see if Herzing is a good fit for you or someone you know. Now let's move on to the Q&A section. And thank you in advance to Kyle and Haley who have been behind the scenes working the chats and now will direct your questions. Please note that a copy of this presentation will be emailed to all participants and any unanswered questions will be responded in a timely manner. Uh, looks like we're getting some questions and uh, some have been addressed already, but uh, what's the shortest nursing program you offer so that I can become a nurse quickly? Hi, this is Tricia and I will answer that one. Our LPN program is the shortest program and can be completed in just as few as 12 months. Um, we offer obviously several other programs such as our ASN and BSN that you could later bridge into if you want to continue your nursing education from that point. We have another along the lines of the nursing programs. Uh, do you accept nursing credits from other colleges if someone wants to transfer to Herzing? We do, we offer a, a we accept a lot of transfer credits. So one of the easiest ways you can do this is call in and we can just help you review, go over your transcript and see what is eligible to transfer and get you started there. Do, do I still have time to get accepted into the fall program? I'm working on getting all my information in and uh, getting her um, a second BS. Is there still time to enroll in fall? Absolutely. That's one of the benefits of attending school at Herzing University is we don't have a wait list and we accept uh, enrollments clear up until the week before school starts. So absolutely. We look forward to having you in the fall.
Just a reminder, everybody, if you have a question, go ahead and put it into the chat. We just had a bunch come in. <laughs> Uh, what level do, of accreditation does Herzing have? So all of our nursing programs are accredited uh, through uh, CCNE. And so um, we've had that accreditation since beginning in 2009 and we've added programs along the way, but currently all of them are accredited and we are accredited in several states across the country. So um, we meet a lot of the needs for not only uh, going back to school, but also even with employers. All right, got a couple of questions about testing. So when is the right time to take a TEAS test? Great question. Usually those are done prior to entering into the, the program that you've you desire. Um, one of the best things to do with that is reach out to your admissions representative and they can help guide you in that process, whether you're ready to test, whether you've done some pre-work to do that, uh, but they can help really guide you and give you the clear steps that will give you a, a good time to test for you. I think a really good question just came in with the current circumstances. So do you have a fear of getting COVID-19 and how do you get over those fears? That is a great question. You know, I do not have a fear of getting COVID-19. And I think the important thing is, is making sure that you're protecting yourself as well as protecting your family. And this is a great question, Kyle. You may wanna, um, Kyle Ebert, you may wanna jump in too. But I think one of the things that we're very, fortunate in is when you work for an organization, they are there to help prepare you for taking care of patients that have COVID-19 and for protecting yourself. So they don't usually let any of us go into a, a situation that is going to put us at risk. However, just being a nurse, sometimes you tend to take that risk, as Kyle mentioned in his portion of the program, you, you see somebody that's going to fall and your first go, your first go to is I want to help them. So you might not take those precautions as seriously right then and there, even though you know it's important. It was important to help that, that patient to keep from falling. Um, good hand washing, making sure that you're wearing a mask, making sure you're using all the precautions that are offered to you are really important. Kyle, do you have any other um, recommendations on that from your point of view? Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Patricia. I, I'd say our hospital at least has done a very good job of uh, keeping us pretty supplied with the PPE, the, the protective equipment that we need. There have been, for a little while, there were some shortages that, that caused a little bit of a struggle, but we dealt with them as, as best we could. I, at no point, have felt like our hospital has not given us the stuff we need to protect ourselves. Um, there's always a little bit of pushback with certain things, but generally management has been fairly receptive when the nurses are having issues with something. Um, so there's always, you know, that risk that you're you're going to go in and you're going to get exposed, but I don't feel like, at least in my experience, that we have been being terribly unsafe. Uh, I have felt protected. Uh, hand hygiene is very important. Uh, using the equipment that is available to you is very important. One of the big things uh, that I, I've actually read uh, separately was that, that I've kind of stuck with me is in a pandemic, there's no such thing as an emergency. Um, which is sad, but that's where you get into those situations where the nurse runs into the room and doesn't wear the equipment she should have and gets sick uh, because you have to, number one, take care of yourself because you can't 
get sick and spread that to your other patients. Um, so a big part of it is more the human aspect of you have to keep in mind what you need to do for yourself um, and the supplies are there for you. You just need to make sure you utilize them appropriately. I think that's all the time we have for questions now. Well, this concludes our webinar today. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to join us. Again, you can find additional information on our website or give us a call to speak to one of our admissions advisors. And some of the questions that are still in the um, portion, the questions there, they will be answered in a timely manner. But again, please reach out to an admissions advisors for further information. Have a great day, everyone.